Welcome, Wanderers of the Galaxy, to a journey across the sands of time and space. Today, we delve into the heart of Arrakis, the world of Dune. Prepare to uncover the secrets of the spice, the power of the sandworms, and the mysteries of the Fremen. This is Cinematica, and these are 107 facts about Dune. Heads up, there are spoilers ahead. Welcome to Cinematica, your new home for all things movies and TV. From Doctor Who to Harry Potter, we'll be going through all your favorites and favorites you didn't even know you had. Before we begin, we publish new videos every week. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Number one. Dune 2021 is directed by Denis Villeneuve, a Canadian filmmaker known for his work on Arrival and Blade Runner 2049. Number two, Villeneuve had been a fan of Dune since he was 12 years old and adapting it for the big screen had been a lifelong dream of his. Number three, Villeneuve himself wrote the script along with Eric Roth and John Spates. Roth is a veteran screenwriter who has worked on films like Forrest Gump and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, while Spates has worked on films like Doctor Strange and Prometheus. Number 4. The film's composer, Hans Zimmer, is also a big fan of Dune. He even turned down working with Christopher Nolan on Tenet to score Dune. Number 5. This made Tenet the first Christopher Nolan film Zimmer didn't score in 15 years. Number 6. In a similar vein, Villeneuve was the top choice to direct the Bond film No Time to Die, but he stuck with Dune instead. Number 7. Hans Zimmer spent a week alone in the deserts of Utah to assimilate the sounds of the landscape into his thinking for the score. Number 8. Zimmer even ended up inventing new instruments and developed his own language for the choral arrangements, making the score sound like it was incorporating music from another world. Number 9. Denis Villeneuve has stated that he sees Dune as a call to action for the audience. He believes that the film's themes of environmental destruction and the misuse of power are particularly relevant today. Number 10. The film's cast includes a number of notable actors, including Timothy Chalamet, Rebecca Ferguson, Oscar Isaac, Josh Brolin, Stellan Skarsgård, Dave Bautista, Zendaya, Jason Momoa, and Javier Bardem. Number 11. The film's production was super international. The scenes on the ocean world of Caladan were shot in Norway, while many of the desert scenes on Arrakis were shot in Jordan and Abu Dhabi. Number 12. The film sports a distinctly Arabic theme, in keeping with author Frank Herbert having used Islamic culture as an influence for the story. This cultural influence can be seen in the design of the costumes, the architecture, and the language used by the Fremen people. Number 13. The film opens with the phrase, dreams are messages from the deep, foreshadowing Paul's visions throughout the film, where he's able to see the past, future, and possible timelines. Number 14. The design for the sandworms took around a year to finalize. Denis Villeneuve knew the sandworms were vital to Dune and wanted to ensure that they were depicted accurately and impressively on the big screen. Number 15. The visual effects team used the movements of snakes and eels as inspiration for the enormous subterranean creatures. Number 16. The Swordmaster, Duncan Idaho, played by Jason Momoa, uses a fighting style in the film called Kali, which is the national martial art of the Philippines. Momoa learned this fighting technique specifically for the film. Number 17. His dedication doesn't end there. Idaho's facial hair goes through at least three distinctive stages in the film, starting with Momoa's trademark full beard, which means he had to progressively shave it down. Number 18. Dr. Yue's death is different in the film and the novel. In the novel, Dr. Yue is stabbed in the back by Peter de Vries, but in the film, Baron Harkonnen himself kills Yue by slashing his neck. Number 19. Fun fact about Yue's movie death. He's almost entirely decapitated. It's hard to see clearly, but if you take a look at the far right when it happens, you'll see that he's got a lot in common with a certain wizarding school ghost named Nick. Number 20. In Fremen tradition, a Chris knife is not to be unsheathed if it's not to taste blood. When the Fremen draw their knives on Jessica and Paul, but are later asked to stand down by Stilgar, they all cut their wrists before returning the blades to their scabbards. Lore accuracy, folks. Number 21. Chris knives are fashioned from the teeth of dead sandworm, and any non-Fremen who sees one must be killed on the spot. Number 22. Water rings, a form of Fremen currency from the novels, are subtly included. In the film, tiny silver rings are braided around the neck of Jamis' body bag, possibly representing these water rings. Number 23. 
The film's production design team built a 20,000 square foot set for the Atreides castle on Caladan. The set was so large that it had its own weather system with clouds forming at the top. Number 24. The film's costume designer, Jacqueline West, worked closely with Villeneuve to create the unique look of the film. She drew inspiration from cultures around the world, including the Bedouin people of the Middle East and the Samurai of Japan. Number 25. The sand dunes of Arrakis are truly a sight to behold. They seem almost impossible, and that's for good reason. They were created using a combination of real sand and digital effects. Don't worry, it's mostly real sand. Number 26. Fade Rotha. Baron Harkonnen's nephew and House Harkonnen's chosen heir does not appear in the 2021 film. However, considering how important a character he is, most assume that he'd be brought in later. And it's looking like that is the case, as the trailer for part 2 is here and it features Austin Butler. I wonder if he pulls up any Elvis-style dance moves. Number 27. Fade was played by Sting in the 1984 version of Dune, but unfortunately did not get to play a Wicked bass solo. Number 28. Sting was even considered for a remake cameo, but he ended up dropping out due to scheduling conflicts with a French comedy drama fantasy flick called Camelot, the first chapter. Number 29. The film includes several references to bulls, which are significant symbols in the Atreides family. There's a statue of a man fighting a bull and a mounted bullhead in the Atreides dining room. These are tributes to Duke Leto's father, who died in a bullfight. The bullfighting is a metaphor for the dangerous political game that Leto finds himself in with Baron Harkonnen. And what do you get when you mess with the bull? Number 30. Paul's duel with Jamis represents the death of his old self and the birth of his new identity as a member of the Fremen. Number 31. After Jamis is killed, his body is wrapped up, which some might see as a sign of respect. However, the only reason the Fremen spend the time and energy to wrap up his body is to preserve its water. His body's just going back to the siege to get drained and used by the tribe. Number 32. The film introduces the concept of Mentats, aka human computers. In the Dune universe, artificial intelligence is considered a sin, so humans use the spice to expand their mental capacity and become living computers. Nobody tell the Emperor about ChatGPT, alright? Number 33. Thufir Howitt, a character who serves House Atreides, is a Mentat. Number 34. Despite the death of Peter de Vries, the Harkonnen Mentat, in the 2021 film, Thufir Howitt's fate is left unknown. Number 35. When Duke Leto says that they couldn't afford to lose Thufir Howitt's mind when he tried to resign, he was referring to his spice-enhanced brain. Number 36. Villeneuve's adaptation is the third on-screen adaptation of Dune. In 1984, David Lynch's adaptation thrilled many fans and disappointed others. The director himself later disowned the work, saying that its producers didn't let him make the film he wanted. Critics largely panned the film and fans of the source material were divided. Over time, attitudes have softened, however, and the film now stands as a pillar of the science fiction genre, particularly aesthetically. Nothing before or since has looked quite like it. Number 37. Nearly two decades later, a Dune TV miniseries, also known as Frank Herbert's Dune, was commissioned by the Sci-Fi Channel and aired in 2000, proving to be a mammoth success for the network, and spawning a 2003 sequel miniseries titled Frank Herbert's Children of Dune. Both miniseries ranked among the network's top three highest rated shows ever at that time. Number 38. Less well-known, but the source of many rumors, much speculation, and an award-winning 2013 documentary is Alejandro Jodorowsky's unsuccessful attempt at his own adaptation in the early 70s. A French group led by Jean-Paul Gibbon purchased the film rights to Dune and tapped Jodorowsky to direct. The filmmaker worked with comic artist Jean Mobius Giraud on a massive 3,000 drawing storyboard for a film that he predicted could run between 10 and 14 hours. Number 39. Jodorowsky even managed to recruit Salvador Dali to play Emperor Shaddam IV, with other proposed casting including Orson Welles, Mick Jagger, David Carradine, and Geraldine Chaplin, among others. Pink Floyd were favorites to score the film. Number 40. Speaking of Pink Floyd, the first full trailer for Dune features Hans Zimmer's version of Pink Floyd's Eclipse. They didn't let Jodorowsky have his 14-hour Dune, but Pink Floyd finally made it in. Number 41. This caused digital demand for the song to skyrocket more than 1,700% in the days following the trailer's release. Number 42. Also, in that first trailer from 2020, there's a take of Paul screaming loudly during the Gamjabar test. That take is not in the film, where he doesn't scream, not on camera anyway, and keeps his face mostly straight. Number 43. 
David Lynch, the director of the previous Dune back in 1984, has stated that he has zero interest in the latest version of Dune. His issues with the new movie have nothing to do with the director Denis Villeneuve or the direction the film took, but instead with his own painful memories of making the 1984 version. He described it as a heartache and a total failure for him. Number 44 Charlotte Rampling was offered the role of Lady Jessica in Alejandro Jodorowsky's unmade adaptation, but she balked upon learning of a scene that would have featured a hundred extras defecating at once. In the latest Dune, over 40 years later, she was cast as the Reverend Mother. Number 45 From the start, Denis Villeneuve said he wanted his adaptation of Dune to be two parts. This would ensure that all of the important information got covered and that it also wouldn't be cut into a million pieces. Number 46. However, only the first movie was greenlit and produced, with an optional sequel depending on the performance. Villeneuve didn't have to wait long though, as a sequel was greenlit the Tuesday after the film opened. Number 47. Dune Part 1 was originally supposed to end later in the story, but during pre-production these final scenes were shifted to the sequel. Number 48. Goof Time. In the scene where Paul and his father Leto are walking through the field between storage sheds, the sheds are more or less perpendicular to their path. After they stop walking, the angle of the shed behind them shifts to being roughly horizontal to their path. I wonder if that's just the spice talking. Number 49. Another mistake occurs when the injured woman puts her bloody right hand over Leto's left shoulder. The bloody handprint ended up being lower on his shirt or lapel than would be expected. And there's no blood on top of his shoulder or a smear downward. Number 50. When Leto stood up after getting shocked, the location and image of the bloody handprint was different again. And again, I blame it on the spice. Number 51. Speaking of the spice, it's produced by sandworm larva. Another name for this stuff is melange. And it extends life, provides superhuman levels of thought, and makes fold space travel possible. No wonder everybody wants it. Number 52. You can see the Fremen using sandworms as weapons in one of Paul's visions. When Paul sees Chani walking up over a rock ledge, there are Fremen popping up out of the ground to ambush their enemy. Sand explosions seem to emerge from the mouth of a gigantic sandworm. Number 53. When Lady Jessica quoted the Litany Against Fear, possibly the most recognizable quote from the franchise, it is slightly altered. The word total is left out, with the original quote reading, Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. Number 54. Four years after Lynch's film hit theaters, Tim Burton dropped Beetlejuice, which also features massive predatory worms that tunnel beneath the deserts of Limbo. I wonder if I can say Beetlejuice two more times before the end of this video. Ah, uh, one more, I guess. Number 55. Giant sandbound worms also pop up in the SpongeBob SquarePants episode Sandy, SpongeBob, and the Worm, and Adventure Time's Red Starved. Number 56. Cult classic sci-fi cartoon Futurama is loaded with Dune references, including Fry trying on a still suit, sandworms being used as mass transit on Mars, and Miss Arrakis competing in the Ms. Universe pageant. Graining's earlier, more down-to-earth creation, The Simpsons manages to squeeze in a reference as well, when Lisa eats food with too much spice, declaring, I can see through time, a power associated with the melange spice of Dune. Number 57. Even Wes Anderson sneaks a quick Dune reference into his decidedly non-sci-fi movie Moonrise Kingdom, where Susie's favorite fantasy novel, The Girl from Jupiter, has a dust jacket with a map of Arrakis' North Pole. Number 58. The Padasha Emperors are the hereditary rulers of the Old Empire, reigning over the known universe. Their power is kept in check by a feudal arrangement with noble houses of the Landsrad and the Spacing Guild. While the Emperors and the houses of the Landsrad share political power, both are dependent on the Spacing Guild for interstellar travel, creating a tenuous sense of stability. Number 59. The Landsrad Council, combining the military strength of all the great houses, is known as the only thing capable of being a match for the Imperial Sardaukar forces. Number 60. Reporting to whatever noble family is currently overseeing the planet, the Fremen are a group of humans who have lived on the rocky outcroppings of Arrakis for generations. Constantly fighting for survival, they're skilled in combat and hardened by the planet's harsh environments. The Fremen live in tribes called sieges and value water above all else. Number 61. A still suit is a full body suit worn by the Fremen, which recycles the body's expelled moisture and filters it into potable drinking water. The suit is frequently paired with a filt plug, a breathing device which enhances this process. Number 62. The Bene Gesserit is a matriarchal religious group operating outside of the traditional political structure. Often considered a coven of witches by many, they are able to use an ability known as the voice to control the actions of others. 
Importantly, Paul's mother, Jessica, is a member of the Bene Gesserit. Number 63. Paul's visions are not just simple premonitions, instead representing potential outcomes based on actions he's considering. This concept is further explored in the Dune sequels, where Paul has to deal with the implications of viewing multiple potential futures. Number 64. The visions we see are scenes that will happen in the later movies. How much have you figured out already? Will this foreshadowing pull some twists on us? Number 65. The term Kwisa Tadarak in the Dune series translates to the shortening of the way, which refers to finding a quicker way to a better future. This is the ultimate goal of the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, which aims to create a super being who can see the perfect timeline and guide everyone towards it. Number 66. Paul is originally believed to be the Kwisa Tadarak, the one who will see the perfect timeline for humanity, also known as the Golden Path. However, he becomes too afraid to pursue it due to the atrocities he sees being committed in his name in one of the possible iterations of said Golden Path. Number 67. In the end, it's actually his son, Leto Atreides II, who has to pursue the Golden Path. Number 68. Fade Ratha is also a significant figure in the Bene Gesserit's breeding program. They wanted Fade to wed an Atreides female heir to produce the Kwisatz Haderach, suggesting that Fade had just as much genetic promise as Paul. Number 69. Duncan Idaho may have died in Dune Part 1, but he's not gone for good. In the Dune universe, there's a form of cloning called Golas, where the clones are created from the cells of a person who has died. These clones even have the memories of the original person, making them a semi-perfect backup. Everyone's favorite Swordmaster will return, just not exactly as we remember. Pretty close, but not exactly. Number 70. Baron Harkonnen looks like a grotesque lump of flesh as a result of Bene Gesserit revenge. Reverend Mother Mohayim inflicted this hideousness upon him when he was young as a part of the Space Witch's grand breeding program. No wonder he's so pissed off. Number 71. In addition to the manipulation he was put through by the Bene Gesserit when he was younger, the Baron also has children and grandchildren that he is unaware of. Number 72. The young women playing the Baron's servants both have alopecia, which renders them naturally completely hairless all over their body. Number 73. The term Fadekin is a reference to the elite Fremen units in the Dune universe. These units, armed with Chris knives, become more powerful as their number of opponents increases, making them the perfect unit to spearhead an attack. In the books, the Fadekin are former Fremen guerrilla fighters who later become Wadib's personal guard. Number 74. The colors of House Atreides are green and black, as described in Paul's visions as the green-black banners of the coming Jihad. Number 75. A good deal of the filming of Dune took place in the sprawling deserts of Jordan, where the cast and crew worked for months under the blazing sun. Number 76. Being in the middle of the desert made the star-studded cast and crew realize how insignificant they really were, stripping away egos and allowing deeper connection. Number 77. The cast described the harsh conditions as Mother Nature engulfing you. The shoot made them into a tight-knit unit, ready for just about anything. Number 78. The film's cast underwent extensive physical training for their roles. This included combat training, horse riding lessons, and sword fighting. Number 79. Timothy Chalamet in particular had a lot of training to complete, with wielding a sword being at the forefront. Number 80. Rebecca Ferguson, who plays Lady Jessica, underwent six months of training in martial arts, sword fighting, and language. I wonder if she devoted herself to the Bene Gesserit as well. Number 81. Dune was filmed with relatively little CGI. Director Denis Villeneuve believed that only real sets could bring true inspiration to the movie. Enormous sets were constructed in Budapest for the indoor portions, and CGI was only used to enhance what had already been constructed. Number 82. Timothy Chalamet's performance as Paul Atreides was so moving that it brought Denis Villeneuve to tears. He admitted to crying tears of joy once he realized he made the right choice casting Chalamet. Number 83. For the sandworm effects, VFX supervisor Paul Lambert incorporated giant platforms on rigs placed in the middle of the desert. When a sandworm passed beneath them, the platform would rumble and shake, and the actor's limbs would visibly start sinking into the sand. Number 84. Many of the scenes incorporating ships were created using practical effects. For example, the thopters were constructed using gimbals on the highest hills in Budapest. Actors would sit inside their cockpits and be moved by the effects crew to simulate whatever was going on in that particular scene. Number 85. The interiors of the Emperor's Palace were constructed to reflect the culture on Arrakis. Fresco paintings and other artwork covering the walls were handmade by expansive design teams for the movie. Number 86. 
The visual effects were created by a team of over 200 artists from the visual effects company DNEG. The team worked on the film for over a year, creating epic landscapes, massive sandworms, and futuristic technology. Number 87. Stellan Skarsgård, who played Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, spent almost 30% of his time working on the movie in the makeup chair, and it definitely shows. Number 88. Costume designers Jacqueline West and Bob Morgan created more than 1,000 costumes for the movie, taking inspiration from Greek and Roman mythology and looking to the dramatic tragedy that defines the source material. Number 89. The still suits were created based on casts of the actors. This worked out well considering that the wearer's movements technically activate the suit, requiring them to be as form-fitting as possible. Number 90. The film's release was delayed multiple times due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was originally scheduled to be released in November of 2020, but was eventually released in October of 2021. Number 91. Action figures for the film appeared in Target stores a little early, in February of 2021. I guess the manufacturers didn't want to wait for the new release date. Number 92. Dune's budget clocked in at over 165 million. Despite this number, Villeneuve has stated that he had to fight for every penny to bring his vision to life. With the sequel being put off until the numbers from part 1 rolled in, it's pretty apparent this movie was seen as a gamble by the higher ups. Number 93. Dune's marketing, however, has been particularly extensive, with the film's pre-release efforts dancing to the tune of another 135 million. This brings Dune's total costs to a nicely rounded 300 million. Number 94. Dune's box office performance, raking in over 400 million, is certainly a qualified success. It was Warner Brothers' biggest movie in 2021, as well as the biggest of Villeneuve's career. Number 95. Denis Villeneuve was furious at the decision to put the film on HBO Max along with the rest of the studio's 2021 films, accusing it of destroying any possibility of the franchise continuing. Despite this, everything seemed to work out alright. Number 96. It's been reported that Dune was viewed on HBO Max by a whopping 1.9 million US households during its opening weekend. Number 97. Of course, we now know that part 2 is on its way. However, it's looking like the release will be strictly theatrical. No more dual HBO Max releases. Number 98. The game Dune Spice Wars features a plethora of easter eggs that only true fans of the novels will discover. Number 99. The game introduces Kulan Caravans, the game's only non-military unit. The Kulan are given a vague mention in the wider lore of the franchise, but are believed to be a type of wild donkey adapted for Arrakis and domesticated by the Fremen. Number 100. House Korono is coming to Dune Spice Wars with the next major update. This update will put the player in control of Padishah Emperor Shaddam Karino IV, and will offer a very different set of economic scales for the player to balance. Number 101. Brian Herbert, Frank Herbert's son who continued the Dune saga after his father, fully approved of the film. Number 102. Kyle MacLachlan, who played Paul Atreides in the 1984 film adaptation, was very supportive of Timothy Chalamet's casting as Paul. Number 103. The 15-year-old Paul, at the beginning of the story anyway, is once again played by someone who's over 20. Number 104. The Sardaukar throat singing scene achieved mimetic mutation status. Look in the comments of any video that includes throat singing and chances are high that you'll see Sardaukar being mentioned. Number 105. The producers originally wanted Emma Roberts for Princess Irulan, but she wasn't free. This character was completely adapted out of part 1, suggesting some serious rewrites. Florence Pugh will play the role of the princess in part 2. Number 106. The film debuted in France, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Switzerland on September 15th, over a month before the US and Chinese releases of October 22nd, and launched in most of Europe by September 17th. Number 107. Neil Bell spoke the Bashar's lines in English on set, and then dubbed them over in the black speech heard in the final film in post. And with that, our journey across the sands of Arrakis comes to an end. We've delved into the mysteries of the spice, faced the mighty sandworms, and walked alongside the Fremen. As we leave the world of Dune behind, remember, fear is the mind killer, but subscribing to our channel, much like Spice, is the mind expander. This has been Cinematica, and remember, as always, we love ya. Did you enjoy our list? What facts do you think we missed? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, like and subscribe to see more great videos every week. And remember, Frederator loves you.